today we're going to be speaking with Kevin Warren, the EVP and Chief Marketing and Customer Experience Officer at UPS. Kevin has over three decades of experience in the marketing world and was recently named in Forbes 2022 World's Most Influential CMOs list and recognized by Adweek as a 2023 brand genius. Kevin, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for having me, Matt. So we're going to take we're going to go way back here, Kevin, um, and you might not even remember um, the earlier part of your career. But at which point do you remember where you knew that you wanted to be in the world of marketing for your career? Well, you know, look, I, I think really kind of understanding the things you enjoy and what you're good at. Um, although I studied finance in, in university, I knew I was a, a people person. I like being with customers. Um, I like really kind of understanding uh, how do you compete. Uh, so it was just a really good fit. Um, and I started out my marketing career really on the sales side. And then as I matriculated up through uh, through Xerox at that time, I got more and more marketing experience and started leading um, marketing organizations as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Sales gets a little bit of a bad rap. Um, sometimes it's typecast. But, you know, ultimately the purpose of marketing is to sell stuff. And I think understanding what it means to sell as a foundation of how you're building yourself is is incredibly important for anybody entering the marketing space. Well, not only the marketing space, but look, you know, I don't know how a company can be successful if they're not selling things, whether it's services yeah. or products, uh, et cetera. Um, and also that that face to face connection with customers and the customer experience and um, the competitive landscape and pricing. I mean, it was it was a really good training ground for uh, for marketing going forward. Yeah, and I'm sure that you've been on the receiving side of many sales pitches over the years, as well as given sales pitches. What do you think makes a good salesperson? So first of all, um, a good salesperson has to be relatable to their customer. Yeah. It's about really enabling what the customer needs and wants as opposed to what they're selling. And then once you kind of build that trust and that credibility, then it's just about doing business as opposed to like a hard sales pitch. Right. Um, less transactional. Less transactional, more relational. You're absolutely right. Yeah. In some ways, that's a lost art in these days. I mean, in this AI-driven era, a lot of companies are trying to build AI salespeople. Obviously, we're in a Zoom-based world right now. And, you know, I think a lot of the core tenets of sales is about relationships. And sometimes they can get lost based on the evolution of how business is done today. Yeah, I agree. I think, look, I think there's there's absolutely a role for digital and technology um, from a sales standpoint. We like to say it's about meeting the customer where they are. Uh, it's about how they want to buy, not about how we want to sell. But if you start talking about a more sophisticated, uh, a long lasting uh, relationship, um, that's where people come into play. And, and those yeah. tend to be less transactional. Um, and when they get out of that transactional uh, space, uh, it's amazing that, that financially that can be good for the company because it's more of a value-based, long-lasting relationship, which tends to come with higher margins and happier customers. Yeah, without a doubt. So taking you back in your career, you joined Xerox in the mid-80s and would stay there for over 30 years. And that's something that we often don't see with young employees who leave school and join a company, they usually look at it as a stepping stone to where they go next. How were you able to, I guess, continue to stay interested at the same company and also for your sake, stay relevant at such a business for so long? And what are some of the key learnings that you remember from your long uh, you know, career there at Xerox? Well, Matt, look, I was looking at it as a stepping stone too. I mean, yeah. it wasn't my plan to be there all the time. I'm sure. And, uh, you know, my, you know, my my first instinct was just to go there to get some experience and to go to Wall Street and do that thing. And a funny thing happened along the way in that I, I really enjoyed the company. I, I enjoyed the people, the relationships, uh, best friends uh, I either brought there or made there, godfathers of my children. Wow. Uh, I met my wife there. And so when you're when you're that when you have that connection between the company culture um, and your own values, at some at some point, the the work um, and the living just kind of go hand in hand. Sure. Uh, and so I really enjoyed it. And then every time I considered uh, going somewhere else, I would either get a promotion or, or another cool opportunity to grow, uh, to go outside my comfort zone. And then the next thing you know, you look up and you know you, you've been there for a good little while, but you've enjoyed uh, you've enjoyed the ride. 
Yeah. Now, Xerox is obviously a company. I mean, a lot of people know them from making photocopiers, as I'm sure you've heard a million times before. But I really look at it as a company that really reflected over the last several decades, kind of the current state of technology, because it was sort of a business business company that had to continue to offer innovation through digital technology for its customers. Like, did you find it to be a challenge or did you really focus on really understanding where technology was headed to stay relevant? Well, you, you had to understand the technology piece because, first of all, it's a way to kind of differentiate yourselves from your competitors. But also, I mean, think about the, in, in one lifetime, just the amount of change, right? So, you know, in the 80s, as you mentioned, that was before really the Internet or, or digital right. printing. Long before. Yeah. So so you really had to kind of understand the impact that technology was going to have on how consumers were going to buy um, and what the value proposition had to be and what the competitive landscape would be. There would be winners and losers um, in that. And then also there would be pressures and opportunities on the business model. Um, so, yes, you know, that, that technology and, and staying relevant um, and really kind of adding to your game um, so that you can continue to be uh, the best uh, is really important. Yeah, and I also imagine another piece, and we've kind of touched upon this, is just understanding the dynamics and in some ways politics of an organization. Because you know, you started off as an intern, um, and by the time you left, um, you were basically in the C-suite of the company, and you don't do that without. You know, I understand like pushing the right buttons and understanding the right people. And I mean, is it about corporate politics or like what is what advice would you give someone who wants to work their way up the corporate ladder at a big company today? Like what worked for you in doing that? Yeah. So, look, I uh, I'll say a couple of things. One is I was yeah, you know, my mom and my mom was a teacher. My dad, I worked for the local government and drove a cab part time to kind of make sure we we had food on the table and pay right. the bills and all that stuff. So I didn't have. Um, a corporate titan having dinner with me every night um, at home. Uh, but my parents really provided a, a, a really good life for me and, and helped support me kind of go through school. Um, but I did have an older sister who uh, who's a librarian, and she gave me this book called What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. And it was okay. really kind of the unwritten rules um, that to kind of help you uh, matriculate through, you know, the, the, the corporate culture, you know, how to dress, uh, how to take feedback, where to sit, um, in a meeting, uh, and meetings, uh, up front is better than in the back, by the way. Um, and then as I, as I started working in the company, I really realized I, I gave a lot of thought to the question you just asked. I said, okay, how am I being successful? And then when I see other successful people, what are the things they have in common? And I really, from there, I came up with this framework of success. I call it the success, success triangle. And it's really okay. kind of three major things. All right. So the one is the, the top of the triangle is performance. So you're not going to, you're not going to get promoted and have all sorts of success or go to company to company. Um, if you aren't able to deliver on your performance goals. And when I say deliver, I mean deliver consistently and at high levels. Um, and, you know, whatever, whatever your KPIs are, you know, whatever the measurements are, you have to nail them and the ability to be able to kind of get things done day in and day out, week in, quarter in, year in and year in. So deliver performance consistently. That would be the first part of the triangle. OK, by the way, you can't you can't do that. You don't pass go. All right. Right. OK. Now, I've seen people that have been excellent at that, but still have not done well because there, there are two other parts of the triangle. The second is what I call kind of behavioral. So corporations, it's not like working in a lab. You know, you're working, they're social institutions. You're working with people. We we're talking about the importance of people. So that means uh, how, how are you able to collaborate? Right. How are you able to give credit, not take credit? How are you able to take feedback? Are you the type of person when somebody interacts with, um, they, f they walk away and feel uh, energized? Or are you the type of person when somebody interacts, you just drain all the energy from them? Yeah. Right? So there is, there is a social aspect. By the way, a lot of people that deliver on that first part, you know, they don't do too well on the second part because they're trying to take credit there. You know, they're, right. they're backbiting and all this stuff, or whatever. So you have to be able to do both. And then the third part you kind of asked me about earlier 
And that is if you plan on being in business for a while, business is going to change, right? So the ability to constantly uh, up your game and, and, and improve your skill set. And I like to give the analogy there, if, like if you're a company, kind of your R&D engine. And yeah. if you think back to the iPhone, they just launched the 15. Um, you know, the iPhone, when it first was launched, BlackBerry owned that market. Um, yeah. And the iPhone 1 was revolutionary. Well, imagine how much trouble Apple would be in if all they had is the iPhone 1 now as opposed to the 15. Yeah, for sure. So when you think of yourself, think of yourself like that, that, that product development, you have to, every year, 2024, Matt has to be better than he was in 2023. If he isn't, the competition is going to catch up with him. So it's really those three things, performing at a high level, from a behavioral standpoint, getting getting along with your colleagues and collaborating, and then constantly adding to your game and getting smarter and smarter. Those three things. It's really interesting, Kevin, because I see the signed jerseys of Mario Rivera and <laughs> Magic Johnson behind you, two Hall of Famers, yeah. and you look at their careers, they did just that, yeah. right? They yeah. obviously had great stats, yeah. but they were also great teammates. Yes. And they also continually evolved as the game did, whether it's changing hitting patterns or plays. And there's some players as we as we know, being sports fans that put up great stats, but they don't make their teammates around them better. Boy, right. And ultimately they don't make the whole thing. That that is a great observation, Matt, you made. <laughs> because that, <laughs> we did we did um we did webcasts for small and medium sized businesses, um, where we bring in uh celebrities who are also good business people and have good leadership skills and they tell their story as what made them successful as an athlete or uh, maybe a celebrity, and then how that translated to their business success. So you're absolutely right. You know, Mariana and Magic, people, their teammates loved playing for yeah. them. They could trust them. They delivered in the moment of, of truth. And they both made their teammates better. Yes, they did. And they enjoyed yeah. making their teammates better. Yeah. I'm sure you feel the same way that, you know, I, I've, I've run several companies and one of the most rewarding things is looking back on the people who used to work for me and seeing that they went off to do great things yeah. and they're creating their own Hall of Fame careers, if you will. It really is one of the most rewarding parts of, of being a leader in business. Without question. And, and that's a, then that's a legacy that stays with you forever. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to your career. So you spent um, over three decades at Xerox and then made the decision um, to make the leap and go somewhere else. Can you talk to us about that decision-making framework? Because I'm sure it was not something that you took lightly back in 2018 to jump to UPS. What was behind that decision and, and you know, what's your takeaways from that process? Yeah, so at, at that point, um, my last position at Xerox, I was the chief commercial officer of the company, which is the only position above that was the CEO. Um, right. And so, and, and we just hired a new CEO. Uh, he and I, to this day, are good friends, Jeff Jacobson. So... Um, it was really about, OK, what's next? And, and the options were either, you know, to go run my own company um, or to go to a big company uh, and drive impact. And so this opportunity, UPS kind of came my way. Um, and it was just to me, I just saw it as really attractive. I mean, this is a company of massive scale. So, you know, roughly, you know, anywhere from 95 to 100 billion dollars, depending upon the year. That's with a B. Over yeah. 550,000 employees, 220 countries um, and, and territories. And so from a scale standpoint, uh, it was probably 12 to 13 X easily what Xerox was. So that was attractive. It had a brand that was very respected um, from a trust standpoint there as well. Really kind of a halo effect we get from our drivers because everybody loves our our drivers. Yes. Um, it was in an industry that was growing. You know, Xerox at that time, printing was in a secular decline. So the growth piece was really appealing um, to me as well. Um, and then from a diversity, equity, inclusion, they had a you know diverse organization, diverse senior team, diverse board. So from a values perspective, it kind of locked uh, it kind of locked in. And then, you know, it headquartered in a world class um, uh, city uh, of Atlanta. Uh, was a great place uh, to live and work. So it had all those things. And then the final thing I would say is it was also a place where I thought I could make impact and make a difference. So those things kind of came together. And thank goodness, you know, UPS uh, had me. It's, it's been a terrific uh, almost five and a half years um, since we've been together. 
Yeah, and and obviously it's had a, a great turnaround in many areas since you've joined. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of those. First and foremost is just kind of the brand itself. So when you join in your role as, as essentially, among other things, head of the UPS brand, how do you look at the importance of brand and kind of like establishing those brand equity pillars to continue to make sure you're differentiated in the marketplace? So, so yeah, so, you know, one of the things I've found is you can have a great brand, but if you don't continue to feed it, that brand could lose its luster. I don't care how great the brand is. I and mean, we just talk sure. about, you know, the company um, that I started with um, and Xerox was iconic brand. It was kind of like Kleenex and, and some of the others where it was a, a verb. I'm going to Xerox something. I'm Xeroxing something. Um, and now not as much, you know, uh, you know, I, my personal email has Xerox in it. And I have to kind of spell out what it is because some of the younger people don't, you know, the company is still, you know, still yeah. obviously in business, but they're not aware. So even something like a UPS brand, if you don't feed it, it either can become passe, um, lose its luster, or even forgotten. So it was really about how do we kind of build the momentum of the brand? Because when we talk to the customers and the most profitable customers were the small and medium-sized business customers, we interviewed like 800 of them. Um, and we said, okay, tell us, tell us what you think about UPS. Uh, what's it going to take for you guys to do business with us more? And and what they told us was, hey, you know, we trust you. You're reliable. You have integrity, all those sort of things. But we kind of see you as old and stodgy. Um, right. So when you start talking about attributes like, is this a company whose best days are ahead of it versus behind it? This is a company that's digital, agile, innovative, cool. We didn't score where we need to score there. And you yeah. think about you now e-commerce and the impact that's going to have our industry. We had to kind of work on that part of the brand. And then the final piece um, of the equation is, you know, UPS is, is primarily an operations company. You know, we deliver yeah, logistics. Packages. Yeah, logistics, right? And so this thing, marketing, you know, this could be a discretionary, you know, kind of when you can afford to do something. It can mean just kind of tickets to the game or the, or the golf uh, match, et cetera. So making sure that we can tie a direct line to the money we were spending and the impact on the results was going to be really important so that marketing wouldn't be perceived as a discretionary spend, but re rather a value driver for the shareholder. Yeah. And I know that you've really focused on both small and medium-sized businesses, and there was the mission chair at the time you've joined, and it's turned around. and. It's interesting because I was thinking and prepping for this interview today just about what it means to be a small business owner. Because in the past, maybe in the 80s or 70s, it was you had a bakery, right? You had um, a dry cleaning shop, whatever it may be. But now the, the barriers to entry to start a quote unquote small business are lower because you have platforms like Shopify. Um, or Etsy, right? That lets anyone really run a small business. And I would imagine, as you mentioned, e-commerce is a huge piece of your growth. So are you seeing changing demographics for what oh, a small wow. business person is? Oh, 100%. percent. Yeah. So look, we've got, we've got the UPS store um, network. Uh, actually, yeah. it reports into marketing and it's a franchise network. So we have 5,200 of these stores in the US. These are entrepreneurs. And oh, by yeah. the way, the people who the customers who use the UPS store are entrepreneurs. And we've actually kind of took took a look at the demographic shifts over just over the last 10 years. And we found that these customers who go to our stores, they, they're demoing younger. They're demoing more gender diverse, ethnic diverse, and then also international as well. And so, wow. I mean, just even over a 10 year period, right? Just drastic changes there. So, so yeah, these, you know, these SMB customers, man, they are they are fighting the fight. They're they're into the grit and the grind. You know, they've risked, you know, everything, everything um, for their business is a generational wealth um, impact as far as their families and their children, whatever. And so, yeah, every everything is so important because their life is their life's blood um, and, and doing business as opposed to just being an employee of a company. You know, right. it's, it's a it's a very They're different all dynamic. In. They're all in one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and and I would imagine you know UPS their shipping 
they also, you know, you talk about reliability and trust. It's also something that it just got to work and has to work in a way that fits their life. And it should be the last thing they should think about because you want them to spend time thinking about their customers and their business, not where is the where are my shipments? How do I access tracking or a variety of different ways they interact with you? Yeah, look, so we we have an impact on their customers. So right. we're, we're we're not just B to B, we're B to B to C. Exactly. Um, and so we can be really impactful on their customer satisfaction and their competitiveness when we do what we do the right way, and we and we do that at a really high level. Um, but we also have expertise um, where we can help these small businesses, whether it's in supply chain, whether it's you mentioned pivoting to e-commerce and the pandemic was an accelerator there on that um, sure. and, and just overall knowledge, business knowledge. And we've leaned in to really kind of leverage that to help these small customers whose products and hustle factor are equal, if not greater than their larger competitors. Um, but they might not have uh, they might not have the, the the capital or the cash or the resources or the real estate footprint to compete. So we try to level the playing field um, f- by advising them and giving them resources um, and leveraging our connections so that so that David can compete and and win versus Goliath, if you will. Yeah, I love that. So and some of the investments your company has been making in terms of customer experience around digital technology and social media. Uh, I imagine are with the customer in mind. So what are some of those investments that you're really leaning into, even heading with Nyon 2024, that your customers really need to, to gain a better experience in working with UPS? Yeah, so look, so our customers, um, so UPS is a 116-year-old company, right? I told you, I already gave you the stats on how big it is and yeah. uh, geographically, you know. So if you're not careful, a customer can get lost in it. And, and so we're really kind of focused on what we call the end-to-end customer experience, whether they start at UPS.com and then they interact um, with our operations people or they interact with our UPS store, which is franchise-owned, uh, or backwards. We need to make sure that from an end-to-end perspective, any sort of friction, or if they're calling our call center and want to get an update as to where the package is, that that you know, that that experience from end to end is a good experience for that customer. And that's easier said than done. Um, But that means that we really need to kind of make sure that our digital experience and our digital game and how we show up on UPS.com, how we show up with our digital partners, you mentioned Shopify is one of them. Mobile Uh, app. Yes, it's it's consistent. Mobile app is consistent with what they're going to get when they go into our UPS store. So we talk about the digital and the physical. We call that digital. That needs to be integrated in. And so yeah. when you go to our website, now you can see where your closest UPS store is based on where you are geographically. And when you go to the UPS store, the UPS store is going to know who you are as well. So really sure. focusing on that end-to-end physical and digital experience. Uh, so the customer, both the shipper and the recipient, has a better experience. Uh, has been a huge focus for us. Yeah, I'm sure. So let's shift gears a little bit because you've um, spent a good deal of time in the diversity, equity, inclusion space. Um, And more specifically, you're a founding member of the Black Executive CMO Alliance. Um, Tell us about that experience and then just zooming out, like how far has the advertising industry come in terms of embracing diversity and what still needs to happen to, to improve in your opinion? So, you know, Jerry DeVard, who was the founder of Becca, and Jerry's an icon um, in the uh, brand CMO world, um, she, called, she called me, uh, I guess it was almost three years ago, and she said, Kevin, I'm thinking about this idea. And she asked me a question that was poignant. Matt, she goes, how many black CMOs do you know? I said, You? And, and and may have been one or two others. Right. Um, and she says, I think that's an opportunity because we're all having similar challenges, but maybe isolated. Um, and then she asks, OK, let's talk about the talent feeder base. And how do we feel about that as far as up and coming marketing talent, black uh, and diverse marketing talent who will be the CMOs for tomorrow? So that was really kind of a compelling reason for us to get together. And 
I, I want to say I'll get the number right. It was maybe 32 or 33 of us who were founding CMOs. I think we're up to like 38 or so now um, of, you know, fantastic marketing powerhouse companies. And and I'll tell you, the talent of these, I am I am awed by the talent of these executives and we share best practices. Uh, we cheer, awesome. we cheer each other on. We pick each other up when, you know, the invariable business challenges kind of come our way. Um, and then a big part of our focus has been on what we call, um, you know, the Becca playbook, which is really the emerging marketing talent and, and really kind of helping uh, nurture uh, and curate the pipeline of talent. So each of us mentors uh, a marketing a black marketing professional of another company. Uh, we've got a two year curriculum. Our, the first graduation is going to be uh, this November uh, 30th in New York City. Um, and uh, UPS, I'm, I'm proud to say we've put in more people um, in this academy uh, than any other company and we'll be sponsoring the graduation process. So it feels good to kind of give back, to be able to network, to be able to share. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a fantastic experience. Yeah, I love how you're creating a pipeline for the future. I think a lot of these executive forums are just focused on the here and now and the people who are in it today, but it seems like you guys have an eye towards the future. So 20 years from now, when maybe many of you are retired or at the, you know, a different phase of your career, that this continues to thrive and grow. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing. So wrapping up here, you know, you've had an amazing career and you're obviously in the seat that most people, if not all, that enter the marketing world want to be in, right? CMO of a hundred billion dollar company and, um, you know, overseeing a really exciting business. What would you tell 20 year old Kevin, right? When you were starting that he had to know based on your experience today to, you know, to basically maybe facilitate that in, in an easier way, or maybe other people who are entering other Kevins around the world, what they need to know. I think, look, I, I, I think that the, the, the primary message would be, um, and this might sound odd, um, because you know I've, I've been blessed to have you know some success in my career, it would be to to be bolder. You know to to take bigger swings, to bet on yourself, to take those risks. You've got it. You are probably better than you think you are. There are going to be some trade offs you're going to have to make along the way. You're going to have to move your family, probably to a bunch of different cities and even outside the country. Um, there's going to be uh, a work ethic, uh, stress tolerance uh, that you're going to have to be able to withstand. Um, but the the victories um, in which you can do for your people and for your customers and for your family are well worth it. So, you know, buckle up, go for it. You've got this. That's amazing. I love that. And, and finally here, uh, Kevin, is there a quote or mantra that you like to live by that comes to mind? So look, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm inviting you into the uh, into the offices of UPS. So I mentioned we're 116 years old, and it was uh, the uh, the company was founded um, by this guy. Uh, his name is Jim Casey. It was, it was a small and medium sized business in Seattle, in 1907. You know, with a couple of bikes and a messenger company. And and part of what we do uh, as a senior team is every our monthly um, staff meeting. Um, we start that meeting with somebody doing a reading for what we call the legacy books, which are a group of uh, speeches uh, that our founder or other past CEOs have given. And so I did a read. And, and by the way, each ELT will will be appointed. OK, you're going to do the, the quote or the reading this month and then next month. So I just had the one last week. Um, and it was really about Jim Casey at his 40th at the 40th anniversary of UPS, which was in 1947. Um, and he was given a speech um, and he was really kind of challenging the team because as, as, as great as the expansion had been, it was really on the heels of World War II. And so the performance had dropped off and the standards had dropped off. So he was really challenging them to get back, no matter, you know, whether it's COVID or whether it just went through a, a labor uh, negotiation or right. whether you were in a retail recession and, and, and those were his issues was World War II. And he gave just a fiery speech. And there was one line um, that I ended the quote on that he said, and he said, basically determined people 
Determined people create the conditions. They are not victims of it. And I, I am so, That's fantastic. I just, I just love, don't you love that? Yes. Especially <laughs> coming out of COVID where you look at, you know, all the companies that thrived and the ones that kind of didn't is, yes. you know, they, they created this new reality yes. and they were able to thrive during it versus them being a victim of what happened. Abs 100%. That's fantastic. Well, we're going to leave it with that. It's been such a pleasure uh, getting to know you, Kevin, and your journey. And I can't wait to see what you do next. I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today. It was awesome. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. On behalf of Susie and Adwee Keen, thanks again to Kevin Warren, EVP and Chief Marketing and Customer Experience Officer at UPS for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.